Tim Kirchin, as always, on the Friday show on Big Board Sports 104.5, the team ESPN Radio. And, of course, Timmy, the ESPN baseball analyst, and we enjoy his work, and we certainly enjoy having him with us every Friday morning uh, in this time slot. Good morning, Tim. Roger Weiland and uh, Chris on a little vacay this week. Brian Mariano filling in. How are you? I'm great. If I may, Roger, this week I sat next to Hank Aaron for four innings of a major league game the other night. And I've covered baseball for 40 years, and I think that's the highlight of my career, is sitting next to that man, that unbelievably gracious man, for four innings as he talked to us about baseball. It was just fabulous. I was watching. I saw it, and, and I was, it was on my list of things to get to you because I, I kind of figured that that had to have been uh, you know, one, one of, and now you're saying it is the, the top of the, the list, uh, highlight of, of your broadcasting career. Yeah, and I never say, hey, did you see that? Well, this was all about Hank Aaron, and that was incredible. I was amazed how lucid he was, his memory, his recall, uh, everything we asked him, he understood completely. He's 84 years old, and he expounded on everything. He came in with a smile. He left with a smile. And, again, that's as good as it gets. Me. No doubt. Hey Tim, was there was there one or two, or maybe even more? But maybe maybe just one or two things that really, when you got to the end of it and then walked away, that that really stood out to you from what he told you and said. Well, you know, he hit cross-handed Roger for a short time in his life. Cross-handed. Try doing that sometime. <laughs> so I asked him what was that all about, and he gave it up when he got to pro ball, but. He said it was he stopped doing it when the bat flew out of his hand and hit a friend of his in the in the bridge of the nose. He said, then I realized I shouldn't be batting that way. But then he explained to us that it was all part of he could also hit left-handed. And he was very close to becoming a full-time switch hitter. He said, and I could have easily done that, but I ended up sticking to right-handed. So I'd never heard that he ever considered, you know, switching and I did not know the history behind batting cross-handed. Tim, there's always those times where we, we get next to someone that we don't want to talk too much and just kind of listen. I'm sure this was one of those times where all the stories just kept pouring out, and it, you can hear kind of the differences between the generations that you're covering now in baseball as opposed to when Hank Aaron played. Right, and that's exactly what we did. We listened. I stopped keeping score for four innings of that game. I never do that. But I must say I was mesmerized, and I just hope that some of our young players who are so spectacularly talented were listening to a guy who had no scouting report. He devised the batting plan every night based on what he saw with his own two eyes. He didn't need a little cheat sheet in his back pocket to determine, am I going to shade this guy to the line or play him more to right center? He knew where to play because he watched the games in which he was involved. And I really worry about our players today that they're not watching the game. They're getting everything from somewhere else instead of their own two eyes. Great stuff. Well, I love I love the storytelling. I could I could just stick with that for the rest of our segment. To be honest with you, uh, Tim Kirchin with us here on Big Board Sports. Tim, I, I think I ask you this each and every week, so I'll do it again. Where do you stand with the Mets right now? Now, now they've lost sixteen of nineteen games. Got three three home runs last night, but that's it. Can't score. Bullpen terrible. Starting pitching not awful. Uh, where do you stand with the Mets right now? And do you still think they will stay the course in terms of not making any trades? For, uh, or, or trading away any of their marquee pitchers? Um, well, they're worse than I thought. They're in worse trouble than I thought, let's put it that way. Their offense is terrible, as you said. And their bullpen since the, the end of April has, has an ERA well over five. And, of course, they're crushed with injuries again. Uh, they're not going to the playoffs. We know that this year. But I still don't think that they are going to get overwhelmed. They have to listen. Don't get me wrong. They have to listen on Syndergaard. They have to listen on DeGrom. And since DeGrom's the only healthy one, they have to be completely overwhelmed before they can trade one of the best pitchers in the game. And when I mean overwhelmed, I mean, you know, uh, 
Torres from the Yankees coming over. Glaber Torres is not leaving the Yankees, but it would have to take a deal like that involving him to make a crosstown deal like that. So I still, and I may change my mind, I still <laughs> think they're going to hang on to their two most marketable pitchers. All right. Well, I'll try not to ask you that this same question again. No, you can. It's, it's relevant every week. Roger, I'm not kidding. I, every week this comes up, and it should because it's that important. Those guys are difference makers in baseball this year. All right, let me get you over the Yankees and talk about pitching. What do you think's going through Brian Cashman's mind now that Domingo Herman looks like he might be settling in? You got Tanaka, you know, out the DL and. You got uh, Jordan Montgomery out for the season, but uh, pretty impressive performance last night by Herman. Aaron Boone was impressed after the game. Where do you think Brian Cash for the Yankees stand right now on going out and bringing in a, uh, a starting pitcher? I still think he's going to go get one. It may not be DeGrom. It may not be Syndergaard, but it's going to be somebody who's got some veteran experience in October, whether it's Cole Hamels or, or I don't know, Chris Archer doesn't fit that category, but the same idea if, of course, He gets healthy. The Yankees have all these prospects. They have the right thing to do, uh, the right people to move if they want to, but they may stay the course. I think he's going to go get some help, but Armand has a chance to be really good. And the next time you guys watch him pitch, look how long his arms are. They are strikingly long. And also understand he's got the biggest hands you'll ever see, and he can can use those really long fingers to manipulate that ball and – and do make it do what he wants it to do, and those really long arms give him some whip action. He is a very, very interesting young pitcher. Tim, staying with the Yankees, and of course following you on Twitter, at Kirchin underscore ESPN, you have this wonderful string of tweets that you have, best of all, Tim, and one of the ones recently this morning you put is about Aaron Boone and the Boone family being the only three a generation all-star family. Give us a little insight on when you talked to Aaron Boone about that and his feelings towards his family and the game of baseball. Well, it's it's such a great story for guys like me who love baseball and loved his dad and grew up like the Boone did. Oh, I mean, that's the only language we spoke in my house was baseball. But Aaron and his brother Brett and their other brother would sit around and talk to Ray Boone, their grandfather, about Ted Williams when they were kids. And then they would go to all their dad's games when he was with the Phillies and the Angels. And then, of course, they all met on the field in Chicago at the 2003 All-Star Game. Ray, Bob, Brett, and Aaron, all All All-Stars, all there at the same time. Aaron told me that moment was as good a moment as he's ever had in his major league career. And he told me right to my face, he said, I've seen my dad cry twice in my life. Once when he called me into his office, to tell me I'd made the All-Star team. Remember, Bob was the Reds' manager at the time, and he said the only other time I saw him cry is when I was named the manager of the Yankees. And that's the kind of family stuff that uh, is just unforgettable. Hey, Tim, before I let you go, do you have an update on, on Otani? What, what's what's going to happen with him here? Well, Roger, we don't know, but I don't think he's going to have Tommy John surgery. I think they're going to get through this and it's going to be difficult, much like the Yankees got through with Tanaka, the Angels got through with Garrett Richards, doing this without surgery. I think he'll be back, I want to say, after the All-Star break, let's say. And I think he'll pitch and he'll hit, but mm. they have to be extra, extra cautious because they're in a dogfight to make the playoffs, and they're going to need him as a hitter and a pitcher, but mostly as a pitcher. And this is why they've been so, so cautious with him. Tim Kirchin, great job as always. We appreciate your insight.